welcome to this overview of the Gospel of Luke, chapters 16 and 17, Get Ready for the Next Life. Still in section 5, Journey to Death, Messianic Signs and Teaching. Get ready for all that is to come. We shall look at this passage under three rubrics. Get ready now for the next life, how to get ready for the next life, and get ready now for Jesus' return. Chapter 16 A Shrewd Manager Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. That is to say, to become manager over their property. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe to my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. So the manager said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, And how much do you owe? This one replied, A hundred containers of wheat. So the manager said to him, Take your bill and make it eighty. His master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes, just as the manager hoped to become manager for others so Jesus is teaching us to make use of the wealth that we have on earth to prepare for the next life, that we may be welcomed into the eternal homes that God is preparing for the righteous. More about God and wealth. Jesus said, No slave can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. For you cannot serve both God and wealth. Now, some Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard this, and they ridiculed Jesus. So he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts. The law and the prophets were until John came. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is being proclaimed, and everyone tries to enter it by force. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to be dropped. Yes, the Hebrew scriptures had foretold the coming of a king called Messiah and the kingdom that he would establish. When Jesus came, he brought that kingdom, but those entering it must do so by force because of the opposition they received from the religious leaders of their day. And just how serious are the scriptures? Jesus reminded everyone, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. 
Now, Jesus was speaking to a social structure of his day. The most respectable at the top, about 5% of the population, included priests, scribes, bailiffs, and tax raisers. Somewhere between 3 and 7% were the urban non-elite, including merchants, artisans, and day laborers. The greater part of the society, some three quarters, was made up of peasants, large and small freeholders, or tenants, village artisans, day laborers, and even slaves, who could rank higher than the unclean and the marginalized, about 5%, or the 5% expendables, as some called them, including beggars and cripples. So, Jesus told the story of a poor man who dies. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what crumbs fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. A rich man dies... The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, or hell, where he was being tormented, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So the rich man called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am in agony in these flames. Now, Hades, as presented in Scripture, had at least four compartments or levels, including paradise, where the righteous would go upon death, torments, where unbelievers or the unrighteous went, then there was Tartarus, where fallen spirits are kept in prison, those who sinned during the time of Noah, Jesus descended amongst these and made a victory proclamation before his resurrection. And there is the abyss, where demon armies await their temporary release during a coming time of wrath. But Abraham replied, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. The rich man said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they may not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have the scriptures, Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Was Jesus foretelling his own resurrection? Abraham replied to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, then neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. How then to get ready for the next life? Be on your guard. Jesus said to his disciples, Occasions for sin are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for you if a millstone were hung round your neck and you were thrown into the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to sin. Be on your guard. Now at that time the Romans 
often executed prisoners by drowning them. So what shall we do? First, be careful not to cause others to sin. For God does not cause anyone to sin. We always do so by our own choice or as led astray by others. If a brother or sister sins, you must rebuke the offender, and if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, then you must forgive. Forgive us our sins as we forgive the sins of others. Forgive others who repent. For God forgives all who repent. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. Wrong request. So the Lord replied, If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. Let us exercise whatever faith we have, for God honors everyone's faith in him. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, We are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. Let us acknowledge our worthless service, remembering it is Jesus' worth that saves us forever, and we are unclean. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men with a skin disease approached him, keeping their distance they called it out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. What shall we do? Obey Jesus. For Jesus treats us with mercy. And then we will be cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. Now, this man was a Samaritan. So, let us praise God and thank Jesus, for he has saved us. And God does good for all who ask him. Your faith has made you well. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? So where are the other nine? Did none of them return to give glory to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Again we say, Praise God and thank Jesus. For God does good to all who believe Jesus. Then, get ready for Jesus' return. Once Jesus was asked by some Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, and Jesus answered, The kingdom of God is not now coming with things that can be observed, nor will others say, Look, here it is, or there it is, for in fact, the kingdom of God is amongst you. What did he mean? Remember, we believe that Jesus is the king. Where Jesus was, there was the kingdom. For God always proves himself to believers. In American evangelicalism, there are many strange opinions about what is to happen in the end times, such as this chart. However, Jesus said otherwise. He said to his disciples, The days are coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, 
and you will not see it. Others will say to you, Look there, or look here. But do not go. Do not set off in pursuit. Yes, long for Jesus' return. He is the Son of Man. But do not trust prophecy preachers. They make up many schemes. As the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must endure much suffering and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so too it will be in the days of the Son of Man. So, we expect Jesus to return visibly. We will not suddenly disappear first. But life will go on normally until then, as in the days of Noah. Genesis reminds us, The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind had become great on the earth. Every inclination of the thoughts of their minds was only evil all the time. So the Lord regretted that he had made humankind on the earth, and he was highly offended. The current evil on the earth goes well beyond that of certain globalist schemers. Think about the current genocidal wars going on, both in the Middle East and in Central Europe. Consider state-sponsored infanticide, whereby millions of infants have been destroyed. What about the stupefying drug traffic, now made legal in some state? And the human trafficking? God is watching. And rapacious lending? We mean compounded interest on debt. Then nutritionless foods? Why have we become so sick? Why are we dying at unprecedented rates? We are malnourished. And then the many depopulation efforts, which we shall not mention here. And the spread of Christus religions and ideologies, denying human beings of access to everlasting life. What else can you think of? One day the Son of Man will be revealed from heaven. On the day that the Son of Man is revealed, anyone on the housetop who has belongings in the house must not come down to take them away, and likewise anyone in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. When you see Jesus returning, get ready. And remain ready to meet Jesus. This means we must be ready to abandon everything that we possess. Those who try to make their life secure will lose it, but those who lose their life will keep, save, or revive it. I tell you, on that night there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. And in another part of the world there will be two women grinding meal together. One will be taken and the other left taken by death, or taken to meet him. In any event, remain ready to go, for not everyone will be ready to go. From Jesus, we're reminded that there was the time of the Law and the Prophets when the future coming of the Son of Man was predicted. Then we came to the period of John and Jesus, when the kingdom is not yet coming visibly, but was, in fact, amongst them. As we await now the kingdom of God to be realized, the Son of Man coming in his day as lightning flashes and lights up the sky. Then they asked him, Where, Lord? He said to them, Where the corpse is, there the eagles will gather. In many parts of the world, this is a common sight. Perhaps Jesus meant the metal eagles that Roman troops carried on their standards 
for the Roman army was soon to invade and capture Israel and Jerusalem. So, watch the sky. The corpse is already dead. In conclusion then, we're reminded that in Jesus' time, he referred to Daniel's in his own discourses and to a soon coming persecution in Israel and Jerusalem. When Jerusalem would be surrounded, there would be an abomination of desolation when the temple would be destroyed and Jerusalem trampled by invading armies. We are now in the present time whilst the good news is being carried to all nations. Whilst we wait for the Son of God in the clouds, watching and praying as revealed by Jesus, his apostles, and the book of Revelation.